When Germany's Emperor, Wilhelm II, decided in 1899 that Germany must build merchant ships to compete with the likes of its British rivals, the shipping company North German Lloyd got to work with government support building a new class of ships. In 1897, Kaiser Wilhelm de Grosse, named after the German Emperor himself, was launched. She was the first four-funneled ship, and at approximately 14,000 gross registered tons, was then the largest ship in the world. The next year, Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa took the transatlantic speed record, known as the Blue Ribbon, from Britain's Lucania. And so began an intense maritime rivalry between Germany and the previously unchallenged Great Britain. But Britain returned the shot with White Star Line's new ship, Oceanic, which became the largest ship in the world in 1899. Another German shipping company, and the subject of this video, the Hamburg America Line, came onto the scene with the introduction of the Deutschland in 1900, which took the speed record but came up short in terms of size. Britain and Germany continued to spar over the records for speed and size. This battle for supremacy on the Atlantic contributed to the rapid development of maritime technology around the turn of the century that I so often talk about in my videos. Germany retained the Blue Ribbon for a decade until Cunard's revolutionary Lusitania was completed in 1907 and instantly shattered the transatlantic speed record. Lusitania built upon her success, beating her own speed record three times before being bested by her near sister Mauritania in 1909. During this two-year period, the record for average speed across the Atlantic increased from 23.99 knots to 26.1 knots, nearly a 10% increase, and Germany had been left in Britain's wake. Speed, though, came at the price of higher fuel consumption and pesky vibration, and Germany recognized the impracticality of competing for the Blue Ribbon with merchant ships meant to economically carry passengers across oceans. Hamburg America would set its speed ambitions aside moving forward. Instead, the company would adopt the business strategy of Britain's White Star Line and focus on size and comfort. Even though Germany's national pride and that of the emperor was tarnished by this forfeiture, they knew that they could still compete with Britain in terms of size. The White Star Line had never tried to compete with its rival Cunard on speed, and was well on its way to building the largest class of ships in the world, Olympic, Titanic, and Britannic. We remember Olympic and Titanic as being the largest ships in the world during their time, but in May 1912, just one month after Titanic sank on her maiden voyage, another ship of a different nationality was launched. This ship would be the SS Imperator, and she would dramatically surpass the Olympic class in terms of size. Once complete, Imperator was delivered to the Hamburg America Line and would come in at 52,117 gross register tons. In contrast with the frequent changing of hands of the record for the largest ship, Imperator and her two younger sisters were destined to remain the largest ships in the world for nearly a quarter century. The Imperator class ships were the third entry into the new generation of superliners, and in terms of design, benefited greatly from being the last in line. By then, turbine engines, which were revolutionary when installed on Lusitania in 1907, had been improved and were on their way to rendering the triple expansion engine obsolete. I won't go into the improvements that made this possible in this video, but suffice it to say the Olympic class had come just slightly too early for the superior turbine engines to be economically in sync with White Star's business model. Hamburg America, which had a similar business model, was not hindered by this inconvenient timing, and its new ship was fully powered by the superior turbine engines. Having the benefit of the example of both Cunard's and White Star's superliners, elements of Imperator's interiors were drawn from both, such as the multi-deck dining saloon from Lusitania and Mauritania, and the swimming bath from Olympic and Titanic. Finally, the sinking of Titanic one month before the launch gave the Vulcan Verk shipyard just enough time to react by modifying the design to include a watertight skin extending far above the waterline, and space enough for lifeboats to carry the 5,100 people the ship would carry. Since the original design did not accommodate for the required 83 lifeboats, unconventional arrangements had to be made by embedding them into the superstructure of sea deck. These last minute changes resulted in a delay of the ship's completion, but it would all be worth it. Imperator was finally completed one year after her launch, but before she would be delivered to her new owners, one final touch had to be added, a mammoth bronze figurehead in the shape of an eagle. The eagle reached outward as if on its tiptoes to extend the length of the ship as far as possible and ensure that it would remain the longest in the world after the completion of Cunard's Aquitania, which was still under construction in Britain. Hamburg America apparently failed to recognize that the next British ship could pull the same move. Perhaps, though, they assumed that Cunard would never install such a gaudy figurehead in the name of one-upsmanship. 
The ship's maiden voyage was delayed further by a fire which killed five people, but was kept under wraps so that the traveling public would not be scared off by such a bad omen in the wake of the Titanic disaster. Imperator departed Cuxhaven on her maiden voyage on June 11, 1913, carrying a record-breaking 3,100 passengers. Still, she was underbooked and her passengers enjoyed even more space in addition to the luxurious accommodations. But even with a fully booked ship, nothing could make Imperator feel cramped. The inclusion of only three funnels instead of four allowed for sweeping rooms uninterrupted by funnel casings. This is best demonstrated on B-Deck, where the social hall or lounge was located. Passengers who gathered here to socialize would enjoy a warm and airy space afforded to it by the vaulted glass ceiling extending up to A-Deck. The first class dining saloon below on F-Deck was even higher in recognition that multi-story dining rooms were generally preferable among passengers for a variety of reasons. But for those who preferred, B-Deck boasted the Ritz-Carlton restaurant, which passengers entered via a winter garden. The restaurant offered an enhanced menu and intimacy at an additional cost. After dinner, most first-class passengers would gather in the social hall rather than segregating themselves by sex as in the past. The smoking room, though, was still for men only, many of whom preferred that somber but no less grand atmosphere. There were two imperial suites that went above and beyond first class, each with two bedrooms, a pantry and breakfast room, beds for servants, a parlor, and a private veranda. These remarkable accommodations were located on sea deck and could be booked for 5,000 US dollars. For those passengers who did not have private baths, there were 229 public baths on board, which would give the ship a longer life expectancy, as the traveling public came to expect plentiful access to baths over time. Among those without private baths were the second-class passengers. Aware that second-class travelers were self-conscious of their social standing on board, Hamburg America was careful to market these accommodations as being closer to first-class than to third. In reality, the quality of second-class aboard Imperator was right between first and third. As might be expected, third-class accommodations on Imperator were comparable to second on many other ships. The dining saloon and other public spaces were not as bare as they might have been. And on Imperator, there was actually a fourth class, also known as steerage, whose accommodations were less well known despite their comprising a plurality of the passengers. But when former U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt traveled aboard Imperator in 1914, he noted that the accommodations afforded to steerage passengers, firemen, and stokers was, quote, excellent, and that he was impressed with the improvement over the past 45 years. Imperator's maiden voyage was a great success, mitigated only by the revelation that the ship had a significant design flaw, instability. Imperator signaled the end of the sleek, yacht-like superliner era. Her heightened superstructure and the ornate finishings it contained gave the ship an alarming tendency to roll, even in moderate conditions. The ship had been equipped with a novel system designed to reduce rolling long before the designers knew the stability would be an issue. The system was a series of anti-rolling tanks on either side of the hull between which water ballast would flow and theoretically counteract the roll. In practice, the lateral flow of water lagged behind the roll, and was insufficient in the case of Imperator. The ship was nearly lost due to her instability, not due to heavy rolling at sea, but as a result of a fire while she was docked in Hoboken during her fourth voyage. While being cold overnight, a fire ignited in the dry storerooms deep within the bow. An officer was alerted to the fire by an indicator on the bridge, and he sealed off the compartment and ordered steam from one of the boiler rooms to be redirected toward the fire in an attempt to dampen it. Hoboken firefighters rushed to the scene and began pumping the flaming part of the ship full with water. Those who are familiar with ocean liner history know the results such a tactic can create. By the time the fire was out, Imperator was listing dangerously to starboard. Remarkably, she did not capsize, and was able to make her eastbound crossing on schedule two days later. At the end of her inaugural season, Imperator returned to the Vulcanwerk yard where she was built to undergo some modifications, including the cutting down of her funnels by 9 feet, repurposing of some of the public spaces, replacement of some heavy furniture, and the addition of 2,000 tons of cement ballast. When the ship returned to service, her owners found that these changes had helped, but did not erase the tendency to roll, and Imperator went on to earn the nickname Limperator for the fact that she almost never appeared on an even keel. The ship would continue to struggle with stability for the remainder of her career. But despite all the fuss, Imperator's instability was more of an issue among her crew than her passengers, and the ship was always popular among the public and fiercely profitable for her owners. At the beginning of the first voyage after her refit in 1914, Imperator encountered a storm, which she weathered but at the expense of four lifeboats and the controversial Golden Eagle adorning her bow, whose wings were shorn off during the storm. When she returned to Germany, the figurehead was removed, never to be replaced. It was then that, in my opinion, Imperator was at her aesthetic peak, 
Shorter funnels gave her a cleaner look, and the removal of the figurehead, perhaps the most universally disliked feature of an ocean liner in history, restored the ship's class. While Hamburg America was breaking in the Imperator, her designers were taking advantage of the opportunity to improve the design of her two younger sisters. Vaterland, the second Imperator class ship, was launched in 1913. The changes made to her design were successful, and Vaterland did not suffer from the same stability issues as her older sister. Another design change of note was the shifting of the funnel uptakes outboard. In other words, instead of the funnel uptakes rising from the boiler rooms directly to the funnels, the uptakes diverged like a fork in the road toward the side of the ship and came back together at the base of the funnel. This novel design change allowed for even more space in the public rooms and elsewhere on the ship. One final distinction, Vaterland was not fitted with a figurehead. Instead, her bow was adorned with golden representations of decorative shields and scroll work, which suited her much better. Vaterland joined her sister Imperator on the transatlantic run in 1914, and with the third ship, Bismarck, being launched one month later in June 1914, Hamburg America was ever closer to a premier three-ship service plying the route to New York. But this lucrative trio would not come to fruition. Just two months after Bismarck's launch, World War I commenced. When war was declared, many German ships were stuck in American ports. Among them was Hamburg America's brand new flagship, Vaterland. Appropriately, Imperator was on the opposite side of the route, safe and sound in Hamburg. Unlike many other German ships, Vaterland's crew made no attempt to rush across the suddenly dangerous Atlantic back to Germany. Bismarck, of course, remained in Germany, awaiting completion. The sudden cancellation of scheduled crossings left many people stranded in foreign countries during wartime. In the case of Imperator, which was not going to sail away from the safety of a German port, left many Americans stuck in Britain and France to fend for themselves. The three German superliners lay in wait. Perhaps Hamburg America was satisfied, at least, that their all-important trio was not at risk of suffering the same fate as Cunard's Lusitania or White Star's Britannic. That changed when, in April 1917, the United States joined the war. The Vaterland, still in Hoboken, was seized within hours, authorized by an executive order signed by President Woodrow Wilson. Surprisingly, the Americans who boarded her found her largely untouched by sabotage. The Americans did, however, find difficulty getting their hands on a set of plans for the expansive and foreign ship. Her German builders, naturally, were not going to provide the plans necessary to convert the Vaterland to a functional troop ship. The Americans had to reverse engineer a set of plans. It took seven months to convert the ship, and just before her first crossing as an American troop ship, the ship was renamed Leviathan at the suggestion of President Wilson and his wife. And so, in December 1917, the USS Leviathan sailed from Hoboken with 10,000 troops bound for Liverpool. After she disembarked her troops, she went into dry dock and was given a sparkling new dazzling paint scheme and joined the ranks of Aquitania, Olympic, and Mauritania who were important enough to have their own custom dazzle design. When the war ended in November 1918, the Imperator was no longer safe and she was quickly seized by the Americans. It was not the Germans but America's British allies who put up a fight arguing they had suffered greater losses during the war, particularly in the area of large merchant ships with the loss of Lusitania, Britannic, among others, and deserved a larger share of the reparations. There were three German superliners to go around, so two went to Britain's Cunard Line and White Star Line, while the third went to the United States. Logically, the United States would retain the ship they were already familiar with, the Leviathan, former Vaterland. The USS Imperator was surrendered to Britain and transferred to Cunard, who was immediately displeased with the severe listing the ship was prone to. Cunard sent Imperator back in for modifications, removing all marble bathtubs from first class in favor of iron tubs, replacing the restaurant with a ballroom, and additional permanent ballast was added to the bilge. Cunard, desperate to correct the problem, nearly removed the aftermost funnel, but wisely decided against it. Cunard renamed the ship to Berengaria, after Queen Berengaria of the late 12th century. White Star, though, would not receive its reparation until March 1922, when the would-be Bismarck was finally completed by her German builders. On the bright side, the ship, once handed over, had already been fitted with oil-burning equipment, while the new owners of her older sisters would have to convert their ships later on. As a crew of White Star Line officers and seamen guided their new ship down the Elbe, emotional German citizens were watching. Tensions were high, but the ship left Germany without resistance. White Star renamed their new ship Majestic. Cunard's Berengaria and White Star's Majestic continued to be immensely popular and successful under the British Red Ensign. Although Cunard, White Star, and the United States Lines used gimmicks to try to claim that their German X-Liner was the best, the biggest, or the fastest, the reality is that they were nearly identical sister ships, 
which together held the title of the largest class of ocean liner in the world until the SS Normandy came onto the scene in 1935, 22 years after the completion of Imperator. The fact that the three ships themselves were fairly equal did not deter further antics in petty competition among the three rival companies. The White Star Line, owner of Majestic, in fact had the largest ship by a small margin. But the United States lines used a different method of calculating gross registered tons, which figured Leviathan to be the largest ship in the world. Not satisfied with having just the largest ship in the world, White Star claimed that Majestic was also the fastest, when in reality the Blue Ribbon Holder was still Cunard's Mauritania, a ship designed all the way back in 1904. A fact which Cunard happily reminded White Star. Although the three sisters were relatively equal in terms of design and general characteristics, the United States line's Leviathan was decidedly the least successful economically. Leviathan, capable of making 24 knots with over 3,000 passengers, did not have a compatible running mate. The United States lines had been a fairly small player on the Atlantic, and the Leviathan, a German-built ship, was by far the largest passenger ship America had ever had. The United States lines was in over their heads. This meant that the company could only offer an express service from New York to Europe once every three weeks, so naturally, the traveling public often did not think to book with the United States lines. Even if they had, a potential traveler would have quickly realized, or been informed, that the Leviathan was an American registered ship, meaning that Prohibition outlawed the sale of alcohol on board. As a result, Leviathan routinely sailed less than half full. Those select passengers who sailed on Leviathan despite all this were still less profitable for the company, alcohol traditionally being a significant source of revenue for shipping lines. In the late 1920s, prohibition laws were eased just enough to allow American ships to serve alcohol in international and foreign waters. So Leviathan and other older passenger ships were used to take thirsty Americans on booze cruises. When Leviathan began to lose money, the United States lines manipulated methods of tonnage calculation again, but this time to reduce the size of the ship on paper, and thus reduce the harbor dues owed when it entered a port. But even these indignities could not save the ship. The Great Depression took a toll on all shipping lines, but delivered the knockout blow to Leviathan, which was laid up in New York in 1934, before being sold for scrap in January 1938, and sent to Roseth, Scotland to be broken up alongside her sister of another line, Berengaria, who joined Leviathan in 1939. While breaking up Berengaria, workers found a stash of 400 pounds behind some paneling, likely the leftover profits of a smuggling operation that was so common on the Atlantic. The youngest of the Grand Trio, Majestic, of the now Cunard White Star Line, despite being taken out of service in 1936, made it to the chronological threshold of World War II, which allowed her to live another day. About to be sold for scrap, the British Admiralty purchased Majestic and renamed her HMS Caledonia for use as a naval training ship. But when geopolitical tensions started to give way to open hostilities in 1939, the cadets aboard Caledonia were needed elsewhere and were sent ashore. Now empty and anchored, Caledonia caught fire and was lost in September 1939. Her remains, the last of Hamburg America's trio of superliners, was towed to the scrapyard.